Welcome to Things You Don't Know, where we present little-known facts about well-known people and events, little-known people and events, and often take a different perspective than most, <laughs> and always we do seek to be somewhat entertaining. If you're looking for a lecture on history, you came to the wrong place. For a really good and interesting lecture, sign up for one of Dr. Deneen's classes at uh, King University. In this podcast, we have fun while presenting facts, and we practice what we call boots-on-the-ground history. If you want to know what that is, we have a website and blogs soon to be published covering that, as well as many other things. Okay, today we're taking a look at American football. Truly, football has taken the top spot in sports in the USA. The impact of football in our culture is hard to deny. According to research recently published by Statistics, the most popular sport in the United States is football. In a poll, they found that 74.5% of their respondents follow American football. This indicates that about three-fourths of Americans follow the pro and collegiate games. To be honest, my favorite sport is baseball, but I do like football quite a lot. Well, the roots of American football can truly be traced back to antiquity. Several of the oldest examples of football-like games include the Greek name of Pistikairos and the Roman game of Harpastum. American football historian Park H. Davis went so far as to say that football is probably the oldest outdoor game in existence and cited the 22nd chapter of Isaiah verse 2 which mentions a game like football. In the Odyssey of Homer, in the sixth book, there is a quote, Then, having bathed and anointed well with oil, they took their midday meal upon the river's banks, and anon, when satisfied with food, they played a game of ball. Closer to home, <laughs> Native Americans played several games similar to football. The Lenape of Northeast America played a game called Pahas Amin. Uh, traditionally, teams of men are pitted against teams of women in, in their version. Men were allowed to kick the ball only, while women could kick, throw, catch, and carry the ball. Another game similar to football is stickball, which is played on a field similar to that of a football field with two poles 100 yards apart. That is quite interesting. I knew that similar games had been played by the Native Americans, but hadn't noticed the references in the Bible or in Homer's Odyssey. The actual biblical quote is, the Lord will throw you like a ball. I get a kick out of that. I had really thought this would be a fairly easy and quick podcast, but like many others, we found it wasn't the case. I was a bit Astonished when you told me you had over 128 pages of research just for this first part. But following our boots on the ground principles, the richness and the fascinating backstories of almost anything are just amazing. <laughs> yeah, you're right about that. I was rather overwhelmed with the amount of research, truly. Um, you, know, you are the historian, Dr. Deneen. But I did think I knew a lot about the settlement at Jamestown, Virginia, as I got all turned on by my distant relative, Samuel Weaver, being integral to that community. Well, I was ignorant of the little-known fact that the early settlers at Jamestown, at Jamestown now, this is a couple of days ago, you know, folks, played a game taught to them by the Native Americans that is similar to modern football. The first settlers at Jamestown were more than just colonists. They were also great sportsmen. In 1608, the English settlers and Native Americans there played a form of football in which each team, it wasn't just kicking. They did other things other than that. They, they actually were allowed to throw the ball, but the, the end goal was to kick the ball across the other team's goal line. This unique game was an early version of the modern-day sport of football and a symbol 
of cooperation between two cultures. It is remarkable that these early settlers could find common ground in such unusual activity and that it stands as a testament to their commitment to creating friendly relations with their Native American neighbors. There are also references to several island peoples playing a game similar to football dating as long ago as the 13th century. It was a while back. When most people trace the history of football, they usually trace it back to either something called mob football played in England or an adaptation of rugby football. It seems there's some discrepancy there. Why do you think that's the case, Dr. Weaver? In my opinion, there are several factors. First, the history we are most familiar with was written by Europeans. Second, the history of Native Americans and many different island peoples often was not written down for posterity and are therefore often overlooked or discounted. You're quite correct there. Check out our Asian American and Pacific Islander podcast for some interesting stuff about that culture. You mentioned Europeans. The few people that I know in Europe question why we call American football football since only a small part of the game as we know it now really involves kicking the ball. <laughs> I knew that would come up because my European friends often say that. So you didn't catch me, nani nani. Most people are so convinced that football is an offshoot of rugby and soccer, which I think is inaccurate. That because they think that, though, they ignore the somewhat different roots of football from those other two sports. I believe that pr football predates them both. Another and important and perhaps sexist reason is that initially in many regions, football was played by male and female players at the same time. However, as I said earlier, when I went to mention Palestine, in many cases, men were restricted to kicking the pig bladder, whereas females were allowed to throw, kick, and carry the pigskin. When the natives described the game, they used the masculine form and called the name football. The rules being different for men and women was an attempt to equalize, possibly, uh, for success. Clearly, it was an advantage for the women who generally were smaller and uh, to be able to advance the ball by throwing it to each other. Okay, moving on into a slightly more modern time period. <laughs> I understand that American football had its roots in college football dating back to the early 19th century. The early history of football is very unclear and difficult to verify, partially because so many of the games played were unofficial. I know that the sport came close to being banned because of injuries and deaths. The first official football game was played in 1869 in my home state of New Jersey between Rutgers and Princeton, but many unofficial games were played. We know this because in the 19th century, the Highway Act of 1835 was passed, banning the playing of football on public highways. <laughs> I just found that rather humorous, too. Anyhow, the earliest football games were often dangerous due to lack of safety equipment and rules. On October 7th, 1905, a game between Washington and Jefferson College and West Virginia University had tragic consequences. It resulted in the most deaths at a single football game on the field with 18 players killed or mortally wounded due to the lack of protective gear and an extremely dangerous playing field. Now that's 18 players died, right? Now, interesting. The highest number of deaths at a football game did not occur on the playing field at a Harvard game uh, in that same era, uh, a large group of fans gathered to watch the game and they went to the roof of a nearby building because remember they, this was unofficial. They didn't have a stadium and all that other stuff that we have today. So they go and they stand on this building. 
The roof of that factory collapsed, plunging the crowd down through several stories. 19 people died immediately, and several more died later. I found a lot of different numbers about that. Some people say, uh, you know, up to 23 people died later. But that's all vague, and who knows. Several players were also injured at that game, although none were killed. Were all of these deaths the reason why President Theodore Roosevelt threatened to have the game banned in 1906? That is an interesting story. T.R. didn't actually have the power to have the game banned, and he was actually a fan and had two sons who played. So, yes, I do think it was the cause of his threats. However, it seemed clear to me that it was a political move designed to make the game safer. That makes sense. In the early days of American football, players did not wear helmets or any other kind of protective gear. However, as the sport became more popular, injuries and fatalities began to occur, prompting the introduction of safety measures. The first safety helmets for American football were introduced in the 1930s. They were made of leather with very minimal padding. These early helmets were not very effective in preventing head injuries. And it wasn't until the 40s and 50s that helmets with more advanced design and materials were developed. Today's helmets are designed with multiple layers of padding and a very hard outer shell. They play a critical role in protecting players from head injuries. Additionally, the National Football League has implemented strict rules and guidelines around helmet safety, including regular testing and certification of the helmets used by players. Okay, getting back to our historical line. The first official college football game was played in 1869 in New Jersey between Rutgers and Princeton. The first collegiate games were played in the northern eastern USA. I've heard you mention football games at Virginia colleges that were played even earlier in the early 1800s. What's the story? It's kind of interesting. Princeton University students played a game called Ball Town as early as 1820. Students at the University of Virginia played unofficial football games, and in, in that the Princeton game of Ball Town was, was sort of not official either. Students at, at UVA played unofficial ball games in 1830 against William and Mary College, Washington and Lee University, and Hampton Sydney College. And Emory and Henry College joined the fray in uh, 1840. VMI and a few others um, also joined a little later, but still early. The uh, corroboration of this information comes from anecdotal notes from J.E.B., Jeb Stewart, and John Mosby. That's the guy who was often called the Grey Ghost uh, later in his career, who are alumni of Emory and Henry College. I've actually seen Stewart's dorm room. (laughs) It's kind of interesting. Many of the colleges in the South only held periodic classes during the Civil War uh, period, like from 1861 to 1864, which is probably why the colleges in the Northeastern United States started playing football, official football, earlier. I understand that the early games of football often had 20 or more players from each team on the field at one time and field dimensions varied from school to school. On November 6, 1869, Rutgers University faced Princeton University, then known as the College of New Jersey, in a game that was played with a round ball and used a set of rules suggested by Rutgers captain William J. Leggett, based on the Football Association's first set of rules, which was an early attempt by the former pupils of English public schools to unify the rules of their public school games and to create a universal and standardized set of rules for the game of football. Now that bore little resemblance to the American game which would be developed in the following decades. It is still usually regarded as the first game of intercollegiate American football. The game was played on a Rutgers field 
Two teams of 25 players each attempted to score by kicking the ball into the opposing team's goal. Throwing or carrying the ball was not allowed, but there was plenty of physical contact between players. The first team to reach six goals was declared the winner. Rutgers won by a score of 6-4. to four. A rematch was played at Princeton a week later. Under Princeton's own set of rules, one notable difference was the awarding of a free kick to any player that caught the ball on the fly. This was a feature adapted from the Football Association's rules. The fair catch-kick rule has survived through to the modern American game. Princeton won that game by a score of 8-0. to zero. Columbia joined the series in 1870, and by 1872, several schools were fielding intercollegiate teams, including Yale and the Stevens Institute of Technology. Okay. Walter Camp is a name that you simply cannot ignore in looking at the roots and particularly collegiate football. He is... Walter Camp is widely considered to be the most important figure in the development of American football. As a youth, he excelled in sports like track, baseball, and association football. And after enrolling in Yale at, uh, in 1876, he earned varsity honors in every sport, every sport the school offered. Following the introduction of rugby-style rules to American football, Camp became a fixture at the Masso House conventions where rules were debated and changed. Dissatisfied with what seemed to him to be a disorganized mob, he proposed the first rule change at that first meeting he attended in 1878, a reduction from 15 players to 11. The motion was rejected at that time, but did pass two years later in 1880. The effect was to open up the game and emphasize speed over strength. Kemp's most famous change, the establishment of the line of scrimmage and the snap from center to quarterback, was also passed in 1880. Originally, (laughs) this is interesting, the snap of the football was executed with the foot of the center. (laughs) Later changes made it possible to snap the ball with the hands, either through the air or by a direct hand-to-hand type pass. I understand there have been a lot of changes in the rules about passing. Did this come about because of Native American players who were much shorter in size? Hey, you know what? You're right, Dr. Deneen. The passing game has undergone a lot of changes. I mean, I could probably go on for an hour about all of that, but we're not going to. In the beginning, though, passes were only allowed behind the line of scrimmage. In other words, from one side of the field to the other side. And and how they would use this, because for the modern listener, this probably doesn't make sense the quarterback would get the ball from the snap and say he would go to the right-hand side and a bunch of people would go over there with him. But then he would throw the ball to the left-hand side and a smaller group of uh, people would catch that ball Well, one person would catch the ball, but they would surround this guy and the guy would run down the left side of the field. Okay, The forward pass, meaning down the field, which appears to have been borrowed from Native American rules, allowed for passes to be thrown from the offensive side of the line of scrimmage scrimmage downfield. So this helped to make the game faster and make agility more important, as well as helping to reduce the number of serious injuries. This new modality made the game more interesting as well as faster, as well as totally Americanizing it. The idea of having two groups of men, maybe totaling 40, 20 from each side, repeatedly colliding sounds like a textbook recipe for serious physical injury. Oh, yes, indeed. And I do agree. Getting back to Walter Camp's innovations, 
his new scrimmage rules revolutionized the game, though not really always as intended at first. Princeton, in particular, used scrimmage play to slow the game, making incremental progress towards the end of the end zone during each down, rather than increase scoring, which had been Camp's original intent, the rule was exploited to maintain control of the ball for the entire game, resulting in slow, unexciting contests. At the 1882 Rules Committee, Camp proposed that a team be required to, the, to advance the ball a minimum of five yards within three downs. These down and distance rules combined with the establishment of the line of, of scrimmage and forward pass did eventually transform the game from a variation of rugby into the distinct t- sport and football code of American football. Camp was central to several more significant uh, rule changes that came to define American football. In 1881, the field was reduced and standardized in size to its modern dimensions of 120 by 53 and a third yards. That's 109.7 by 48.8 meters for those who are going to wank me on that. Several times in 1883, uh, Camp tinkered with the scoring rules, finally arriving at four points for a touchdown, two points for kicks, after touchdowns and two points for safeties and five for field goals. <laughs> okay, yes, the, the rules have changed and then we don't have that same scoring set now. And it's sort of morphed over time. Camp's innovations in the area of point scoring influenced rugby union's move to point scoring in 1890. In the 1887 uh, game, time was set to two halves of 45 minutes each. Also in 1887, two paid officials, not not paid much, but they had some pay, were given whistles and stopwatches. And the rules were changed at that time, also allowing tackling below the waist. The last and arguably most important innovation, which would at last make American football uniquely American, was the legalization of interference or blocking a tactic which was absolutely illegal under the rugby style rules. Now, in, interference remains strictly illegal in both r- r- rugby codes. The prohibition of interference in the rugby game stems from the game's strict enforcement of its offside rule, which prohibits any player on the team with possession of the ball to loiter between the ball and the goal. At first, American players would find creative ways of aiding the runner by accidentally, read that in quotes, knock into defenders trying to tackle the runner. When Walter Camp witnessed this tactic being employed against his Yale team, he was at first appalled, as I would have been. But the next year, I had adopted the blocking tactics for his own team. During the 1880s and 1890s, teams developed increasingly complex blocking tactics, including the interlocking interference technique known as the flying wedge or V-trick formation, which was developed by Lauren DeLand and first introduced by Harvard in a collegiate game against Yale in 1892. Despite its effectiveness, it was outlawed two seasons later uh, in 1894, uh, through the efforts of the Rules uh, Committee uh, led by Park Davis because of its contribution to serious injury. After his playing career at Yale ended in 1882, Camp was employed by the New Haven Clock Company until his death in 1925. Although no longer a player, he remained a fixture at uh, annual rules meetings for most of his life, and he personally selected an annual All-American team every year from 1889 through 1924. The Walter Camp Football Foundation continues to select All-American teams in his honor to this day. Wow, we've covered a lot of ground in this one. 
but no official game of American football has ever happened without a coach. I know there have been some really famous college and professional coaches, many of whom have been credited with changing the lives of players on and off the field. You mentioned that ESPN listed 150 college coaches they considered the greatest of all time. Maybe we can focus on things other than coaching strategy to get some f- flavor of how these men worked and thought. I know we can't cover them all, but are there some that stick out in your mind? Well, um, in terms of college co- coaches, ESPN, I, I agree with what they said. They listed Paul Bear Bryant as their number one all-time greatest. So let's start there. Bear Bryant is a coaching legend, but his nickname and story date all the way back to his early teens. Okay. Bryant was given the opportunity to wrestle a bear at a carnival for a dollar. The exact story remains rather foggy, but Bryant did have his ear bitten and was never paid the dollar he was promised. Now, he was 13. And, you know, obviously in today's world, no 13-year-old boy would be allowed to wrestle a bear. But back in 1926, it was not out of the question. From that day forward, he was given the nickname Bear Duck ever since. Coach Bryant was instrumental in integrating football in the Deep South. Now, one story that I found touching occurred when Bryant was he, he was a new coach at, at Alabama and he was trying to recruit a young young player who lived in a small town. He stopped at a small restaurant both to get directions to the player's home and to get a bite to eat. At this time you got to remember restaurants were essentially segregated. Brian sat down at the counter and asked what was good today. The owner asked if he knew where he was. Then Bryant realized he was the only white man in the place. The older owner told him that that they had good chitlins and grits, but he didn't think Bryant would be interested in them. Bryant told him that he had grown up on that kind of real food and asked for a serving. He had a conversation with the man and got directions to find his potential recruit and discovered that Bryant was the coach at Alabama. The man asked if Bryant had a picture. He wanted to have it to prove to people that he'd actually eaten at his restaurant. The bear said he didn't have a picture, but he would send him one when he got back to campus. I'm sure that this owner did not believe him. (laughs) But he did find the potential recruit and made his pitch, but the young man declined. So Bryant gave him his card and asked him to call if he changed his mind. When he got back to campus, he sent the owner his picture with a note saying that the food was great and thanked him for the conversation and thanked him for giving him the directions. Right soon after that, the young man called him, a potential recruit, and said he wanted to come play for him. Bryant welcomed him and asked why he had changed his mind, and the young man said that the owner of the restaurant was his grandfather and had told him that Bryant would teach him more about other things so that he would become a real man, which would be more important in the long run and demanded he reconsider. Bryant did revisit that restaurant, took pictures with the owner, etc. And when a reporter asked him why he'd done all this, he said, It doesn't cost anything to be nice and keep your word. He was right about that. That does show a side of Coach Bryant that is not widely known. I heard an interesting story about Newt Rockney when he was a young coach at Notre Dame. Despite no previous football experience, Rockney recruited George the Gipper Gip to play for his team in 1916. He finished his career with 83 touchdowns and never let a single pass be completed in his protective zone defense. During his four-year career for the Irish, 
He lifted the program to national fame and notoriety. Unfortunately, Gipps' career was cut short after contracting a serious strep infection in a game against Illinois. He died a few weeks later on December 19, 1920. In a game that seemed almost unwinnable for his injury-decimated team, Rockney delivered one of the most famous speeches in all of sports, win one for the Gipper. Rockney told his team the day before he died, George Gipp asked me to wait until the situation seemed hopeless, then to ask a Notre Dame team to go out and beat Army for him. This is the day, and you are the team. One play O'Brien scored the winning touchdown as the Irish defeated Army by a score of 12-6. to six. The next man was truly a giant in so many areas, such as perseverance, civil rights activism, and scholarly merit. This next man was truly a giant in so many areas, such as perseverance, civil rights activism, and scholarly merit. This man is Eddie Robinson. I'm sure you know the other Robinson, right, Dr. Nade? Roosevelt Robinson, who integrated American baseball. All righty. That's, that's right. Somehow we didn't remember Eddie Robinson. Now, he was best known as the coach of Grambling for 56 years. Robinson had a degree in English, not in sports. He had played some football, and he, he was famous for a couple of things. One, he would ring a bell at 6.30 in the morning to get his players up every day. Every day. <laughs> I think I would have thrown a hammer at him eventually. Um, but anyhow, outside of practice, he wore suits, shirts, and ties. He wanted to be presentable, and he thought that whereas clothes don't make the man, they sure do add to his image, and he knew that. He knew the importance of education and stressed to his players that long after their physical skills eroded, education would be their salvation. He was the only child of a sharecropper and a domestic servant. He was born in Jackson, Louisiana, just 13 days after Jackie Roosevelt Robinson was born. That's really kind of interesting to me. Another American icon who helped train the patients, face of our nation. While Jackie operated on the national stage, Eddie worked in the universe of black college football, where he served as head, head coach for an incredible 56 years, as I already said. He did play quarterback at Leland College in Baker, Louisiana. As soon as he graduated in 1941, he became the school's first head coach. Leland was renamed Grambling in uh, 1946. He demanded that his players focus on learning first academics, then the fundamentals of football. He coached a parade of famous players, in court, including Doug Williams of the Washington Redskins, who was the first black man to start and win a Super Bowl as quarterback. Yes, Dr. Neen, I had to put my Redskins in there. Sorry. I don't blame you. Coach Robinson held that black men could achieve anything they worked hard and competed for with determination. He refused to hold himself or his players to anything but the highest standards. Yes, he knew people came from a, from bad backgrounds or deprived backgrounds, etc. But he said, no, if you're going to compete in this world, you have to stand up to the highest standards, not just getting by. Because if you do that, you will just get by. And that's it. He was quoted as telling his players, this is your country. Take advantage of it. You can be anything you want. You can do what you want. This is your country. In a tragic twist, Coach Robinson was suffering from Alzheimer's his last year of coaching and retired at the end of the season. Within a month of his retirement, he was in an institution where he spent one day before he died. He may have struggled and clearly worked hard all his life, 
but he left a legacy that cannot be outshined. You're quite right. We could go on for quite some time, but our time doesn't permit that. What I take away from this is that the best coaches were first focused on bringing their players from youth to adulthood with the values needed to be decent people. I know there were coaches who broke the rules or focused primarily on winning at any cost, but the good ones had and held to the higher principles. I'm sure that many people will chide us for not mentioning their favorite coach, but say la vie. Yeah, I, I just felt like we had to cut this somewhere. You're, you're right, Dr. Deneen. Um I do hope our listeners have enjoyed this first part of our podcast on football. Yeah, we will be getting into professional football and all the business of the merger of the AFC and the NFC and Canadian football and all that stuff, which has been asked to, uh, of us to do several times. We are going to do it. And if, hey, if anyone wants to volunteer to help with that, I'm open. I would be delighted to see your, your information and your, uh, your comments and, and that sort of thing. Uh, anytime you want to do that, that's fine. In the meantime, we will be taking a look at some very interesting topics. Coming soon, like within a week probably. Uh, exploration of aphrodisiac foods. Yeah, 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 we're going there. We will also be looking at one of my favorites, the jongleurs. Okay, these were the street musicians of the 1300s. In the pipeline, we have a very special look at ident- identity issues. We've already gotten uh, great um, replies to a survey we sent out to the LGBTQIA plus community and some surprising information there. Also in the pipeline is an examination of violence in the USA and abroad. So stay tuned. While I'm here, folks, I just want to congratulate a fellow podcast participant, John Munley, for graduating from Bloomfield College cum laude today. We always love to hear from you folks, so please leave your comments. We would appreciate a like and a subscription. Don't forget to click the reminder bell so you could stay up to date with us and the new podcast coming. Thank you very much for listening. So long for now. TTFN.